Freed's Rock and Roll Party. And here he is in person, Alan Freed. I don't know what I can say about this next act. What can you say but sensational? All over the world, Frankie Lyman, a 13-year-old youngster with a great way with a song, and the teenager. Baby, baby. him so tiny on the stage, bursting with so much talent, was something that was really spectacular. He was just a natural born talent. He was, a, he was born for the stage. And it only lasted a short time, which is, which will, I guess it will plague me the rest of my life. Why did the teenagers get back together? The past just won't let us alone. It keeps coming back. That's that's the reason. That's it. Uh, it's like an obsession. I'm not obsessed with the past. The past just won't let me forget it. And it just keeps coming back. This is a problem. It's really a problem. Oh, and T. And I'll tell you about the ABCs. We broke up at a time when the music was still on the rise. Okay? We left at the top. But we didn't get to enjoy everything that comes with being at the top. We never got any money for what we did. We all grew up in New York City in the early 50s. We all hung out together. We went to school together. And we sang together. At that time, singing on the street corners was the thing to do. It was a way to get noticed. And one day we did. This is this school house. exactly 15 steps from where I used to cross and jaywalk to go over to Frankie's house to pick him up for a rehearsal. And Sherman lived right there, I should say, hey, yo. He used to holler, he used to go. Dude. <laughs> I go, you ain't ready yet? You go. Hey. <laughs> oh. I said, come on, man. We've got rehearsal, man. We've got some hit records to make, man. <laughs> Try 
across the street is uh, State Junior High School. This is where we used to rehearse. And uh, I remember a few times Frankie's mother used to come around hollering at the, you know, around the school. Frankie, it's 9 o'clock. It's time to get upstairs and go home. You're my favorite number. There would be a time in his later years when he would have been able to understand what he was doing and what his worth was, but nobody was going to stop and tell him then. They were too busy taking his money from him. Who's going to tell you what you're worth if they're putting it in, your po in their own pockets? You follow me? This is the story of Frankie and the group. We sang on that corner every day every day of the week, all day long. Grocery store where Frankie worked, the window above um, of the store, Richard Barrett lived in. He lived in that apartment. Now, no one knew in the group, at least I didn't know, that that was the Richard Barrett of the Valentines, who uh, later came to our rehearsal in Stitt Junior High School, where we went, and liked us so much that he took us down to the same recording company where he was making records. I asked him, I said, I want you to record these kids for me. You know, do two sides. He said, no, no kids. I don't want the problem with the school board, the business, just the whole business. You know, I said, all right, I, I can understand it. And I walked away, and I, and I got back uptown. I said, how can I tell these kids he didn't want to record them because they're too young? They sing. They're in show business. You know, as far as I was concerned, you know, they had a talent. And uh, then uh, we made a deal. I'll rehearse your, your group, George, if you record mine. The kids went in and did the two songs, and we left. And I think the rest of it is the beginning of the history we were talking about. From then on, it went straight up very quickly. <laughs> used to rehearse in hallways a lot. When the weather was terrible, we took advantage of the hallway with the echo. We knew about five or six songs that we sang over and over again, constantly. Songs like, do, 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 do. Good night, sweetheart, well, beside you. <laughs> you know, we would sing that song every day, every night. Finally, this gentleman came out, and he says, out of this apartment here, and he says, I'm tired of you guys singing the same songs over and over and over again in front of my door. So he gave us a poem this girlfriend wrote to him. It was called, Why Do Birds Sing So Gay? We took it, changed some words here and there, put some music to it, and had a new song called, Why Do Fools Fall In Love? We wrote, Why Do Fools Fall In Love? I Want You To Be My Girl, ABC's of Love. Uh, among others, and uh, we never got any credit for Why the Fools Fall in Love or for any of the songs that we wrote. Donna Ross just recorded Why the Fools Fall in Love. We, we will never see a penny of it, because on paper, we can't claim that we own it. When in fact, we wrote that song at, one, at uh, 631 Edgecombe Avenue, across the street from our school, during lunchtime. At that time, there was more opportunity for managers and record company people to take advantage of the artists 
when I say take advantage, uh, you couldn't take advantage of an artist who keeps coming back with hit after hit after hit. But a group like the Teenagers, who with Frankie Lyman only had a few hits, uh, their place in the sun was so short-lived that uh, by the time they became sophisticated enough to make some money, their place in the sun was gone. fell in love with him. I mean, he was the, you know, cutest little thing that anybody could really fall in love with. He was very uh, emotional, a um, little conceited. I was the president of uh, Frankie Lyman and the Teenagers Fan Club. It was a teenager's dream come true. I received so many letters, I mean, thousands and thousands of letters. Um, I answered them, and my sister was a vice president. And uh, very interested. Everybody wanted to be like a little Frankie Lyman. Yes, sir. Bob Tampin tells me I've been introducing you as Frankie Robinson, Robinson. instead of Frankie Lyman. You know what, how, that, how that happened? No, I really don't. I, I probably was thinking of Sugar Ray Robinson. Oh, yeah. He was quite a champion in his own right, too. <laughs> Let's have a fine hand for Frankie. Well, the musical inspiration came from my mother and my father. My father, he used to sing gospel, so did my mother. My father had a group called the Harlem Mayors, and they used to perform, which they recorded a couple of uh, gospel albums and records themselves. So I guess it came basically from my mother and father. He taught us to become the Harlem Mayor Juniors, and uh, he would take us from church to church each Sunday, and where they sang, when they finished doing what they did, we, the Harlem Air Juniors, came on. I was five. Frankie was seven. And uh, my oldest brother, Howard, he was nine. Well, don't you know I'm tired? I'm tired. So need a rest and I'm tired. So need a rest and I'm tired. I'm tired. So need a rest and Even though we grew up with singing church music, we were never steered in one direction. Regardless of what type of music that we were singing, as long as we did our best, they were all for it. For us to play. No, 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 They set a social trend. And all of a sudden, six months later, everybody and his mother had a group on the corner with a little guy singing in the front. You know, same case with myself. Because you know. I originally, when we got started, I was in the background. And, uh, the baritone Lyndon, who started the group, said, no, you get up in front, you do the lead. You don't know, honey, honey. Honey, 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 honey.
They would get an allowance, as far as I know, you know, weekly, $125 a week. That's what, that's what they used to show me in the limo. But they were the teenagers, and they would come in the block, and the block would be crowded with people from everywhere just to see them arrive. And that's what kept them going. Whatever they wanted, they got. Be it uh, clothes, spending money, money to buy uh, candy, or whatever. But as far as them making a lot of money, having a lot of money, they didn't at that time. And what's mind-boggling is the fact that they were appearing all over the then 48 states of the United States. They appeared at some of the biggest theaters in the world, the Brooklyn Paramount. They appeared at the Apollo Theater. They were probably the first real crossover group. They appealed to everyone. They appealed to whites, blacks, Hispanics, Orientals. They, their appeal went all around the world. That trip was bigger than big. I mean, here we are, 1957, some youngsters going to England, London, where the Queen lives. Unprecedentedly, the people of England just treated my brother like he was a king. And they just totally disregarded the teenagers, uh, you know, publicly. In other words, uh, certain interviews, such as the one you're giving now, um, if I was singing with a group, the rest of my group would be here. But in, in the case of Frankie Lyman and the teenagers, they just interviewed Frankie Lyman. We had been recording all together all the time. And I got some mail from here. United States that our latest release which was out in the cold again was fine and good you know was doing well already but the the flip side on that was just Frankie singing by himself a tune called uh, a miracle in the rain so we made a big fuss about that but Frankie liked the idea and when we got back to America he said he was going to lead the group he was saying it in words over there you know but I don't know if he was the one that was behind it you know he was only 12, 13, you know. Who might have been the hardest? Well, people like our management, you know, uh, his mother, people that uh, had his interest at heart, supposedly. Well, what was the rationale behind it? Why would someone want Frankie to be a solo artist? Well, you consider, you got one guy going, <clears throat> big bass singer, right? They figured, why do that? We can kick a bass, bass. The upright bass, the Fender wasn't popular then at the time, it was coming in. Uh, we lose that guy. We had a trumpet section. But that removes two guys, a baritone and a tenor. Take them right out. Another guy, does alto. That's it, another out. There are four voices that have an opinion and a mind of their own that nobody has to contend with when they got the one kid that sings the song, the lead singer. Someone set you back on your heels. Goody, goody. So you met someone and now you know how it feels. Goody, goody. So you gave him your heart too. Just as I gave mine to you. And he broke it in little pieces. And now how do you do? So you lie awake and sing the blues all night. Goody, goody. So you think I love the ball of Frankie went on his own and began to, to, to do things for roulette, like the only way to love. Good records that never happened. Just couldn't happen. I don't know why they couldn't get Frankie off the ground. Um, but the group went on and got a new lead singer, Billy Lambro, I think his name was, and they recorded a record, Flip Flop, I'm quite sure they told you, and they appeared at the New York Paramount, and the record Flip Flop was appropriate because it really flopped. And um, they stayed, they, the pictures were great and everything, and they looked great, but it just didn't happen. It didn't happen, it was killing them. It was 56 to 57, and that was it. It was over. It hurts, you know? Um, it hurts an artist uh, who's been popular to not have anything going, and you're still in that world, and you feel that you should still be there, and, and there's, not, there's nothing to back it up, to back it up, and it's, it's horrible, and you begin to look for substitutes. 
substitute strength. Drugs was in the 50s everywhere, but everywhere. And it was potent then, too, and cheap, all right? Um, drugs was backstage, you know. Drugs was off stage, on stage. It was just everywhere. And it took a lot of people away from uh, uh, their normal course of life. Frankie was one of them. The drug situation made him a no-no. I don't care how good he was, that was a bad scene at the time. Although there were others doing it in the business who were in prominent positions, but it didn't affect them. But a kid like Frankie Lyman, forget it. His voice is changing. Nobody wanted to develop the change of the voice of the young kid to the young man to the grown man. Nobody wanted to go through that transition with him. Educate me with a caress Teach me nothing less Than a lesson I'll never forget Teacher made me, make me, make me the... By the time he's 17, nobody wanted no part of him. He got blackballed from all the nightclubs all the record companies, the booking agents. The man went broke completely. I picked him up on the streets of Broadway, and my challenge was to make the biggest comeback of his career. Remember when he was about this tall? And now he's about this tall. When he was this tall, he had his first million dollar love. Tell me, ooh, baba, ooh, baba, ooh, baba, ooh, baba, why do fools fall in love? Talking about the one, the only, the great rock away now, Frankie Lyman! to see Frankie. He was at his lowest point. Frankie was no longer the Frankie Lyman I knew. But he was always a brat and egotistical and everything, but he had the voice and he, the, he could back it up. But then without the voice and he couldn't back it up, he was just another Joe. I uh, used to spend a lot of time at one of the booking agencies, Universal Attractions, and Frankie would come in and he would beg the bookers to try to get him a gig. He would even get on the phone himself. To, uh, to beg. I remember once he was calling a place in Union City, New Jersey, and uh, literally begging for a job, begging for work, and, and asking the owner if he remembered who he was, that you know, he was Frankie Lyman and he had so many great hit records. It was a sad thing to see and deal with, particularly if you knew him and loved him like many of us did. I was with a friend of mine from the Navy, and one of the neighborhood kids said, hey, Lou, I heard that your brother died. So I laughed to my friend. I said, man, that's about the fourth time somebody told me that he had died. So since I was so close to my grandmother's, I said, well, let me go upstairs and say hello to my grandmother, and we'll have a joke about uh, him dying again. And lo and behold, there was my father, policeman, and the person from the corridor. It was no joke. I didn't laugh that day. You ever heard that song, Why the Peace Fall in Love? Yep. You know where it was written? Nope. In that hallway. In this hallway. See? In this hallway right here. Serious. Yeah. Where's the same my building in this hallway. The words might still be on the wall. Let's go see. <laughs> Who wrote it? Y'all wrote it. Mm-hmm. Who sang it? Frankie Lyon. It was back in 1955 when five youngsters walk through the corridors of this very school. And ladies and gentlemen, I am so proud to say that here today at Edward W. Stitt Junior High School, 25 years later, 
They are right here. And I want you to put your hands together and give them a real skit round of applause. Ladies and gentlemen, Frankie Lyman's teenagers. Do not to do, bum 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 bum, do not to do, bum 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 bum.